Hi and welcome to the Sunday podcast from the team at GMC, Gillespie Memorial Church in Dunfermline, Scotland. I'm Pastor Mike Weaver, the minister at GMC, and with our team, Reverend Maggie Lane, Reverend David Melville and Elder Ronnie Aitken, we are leading our church to be a people of God seeking to grow in God's word and so bless the city with the good news of Jesus Christ. Our sermon series, Living in the Light of Christ, Confidence and Encouragement in Christ, finds us in St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, a letter full of affection for a church Paul, along with Silvanus and Timothy, had planted. It is a letter full of advice for the life of the Christian and their faith in the world. How to evangelise and be a pastor, how to withstand suffering in life and understand the priorities for Jesus in your life, always with the return of Jesus in mind. Written to a church of new believers, it still speaks to those young in faith, but also has much to say to all believers today, whoever they are. So thanks for joining us and I pray this podcast will be a blessing to you as we seek the truths in God's word. But before that, we come to the Lord in prayer. But let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. How good it is to meet together as a family, Lord, and to come into your house and to bring you our offering of worship for your good and your love endures forever. You're a mighty God, a powerful God, a loving God. That love is sometimes tough. We don't always understand your ways and indeed your word says that your ways are not our ways, your thoughts are not our thoughts. Yet as we come together this morning, we desire that we would be aligned with your thoughts and your ways, and that we would just exalt you and give thanks to you. We live in such a crazy world, Father. The times are difficult for so many, so it's good to come into the house of the Lord to lift our eyes heavenward, to offer you praise and thanks, to place our trust in you, for you alone are trustworthy. You alone are faithful. Your love abounds. And you ask it to abound with each one of us. And so, Father, we ask your forgiveness when this is not the case. When we hold something against a brother or sister. When we disagree. When we speak against them. When we gossip. When we fail to love the unlovely. For your love is so powerful that while we were still in our sin, you sent your son Jesus to save us and redeem us. And there was nothing lovely about us. So thank you, Father, for this abounding love. Thank you that we can lift our cup up and know that it overflows with goodness and love and mercy. And enable that overflow from you to us to reach out to others and especially to one another. Hear us as together we say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen
I hope through our prayers your heart is ready to receive deeply from God's Word. Whatever life is throwing your way currently, whether life is going great or times are stormy, please know that the Word of God is powerful. God's Word is able to challenge, to transform and ultimately to change your life. So listen in to the reading and the exposition from our preacher. If the reading from the Bible and the message from our preacher raises any questions or doubts or maybe challenges you over the way you are living life today, or perhaps you just want to know more about the way of Christ and getting to know the Lord Jesus, then we'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch via our website or through the office. Details are in our show notes. If you'd like to support GMC financially and our ministry for the kingdom, then offering details can be found on the homepage of our website, gillespiechurch.org. Now, over to our preacher. We've sung my heart's one desire is to be holy, and, and we'll hear about that in a minute in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. My heart's one desire is to be holy. But will you notice too that we sung, I choose to be holy. It's a choice. I choose to be holy. And it means going through the refiner's fire. So we'll come to that in just a bit. I'm not going to pray for others at the moment. I'm going to do it after the sermon, if that's okay. So we're going to pick up where Mike left off um, in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to complete chapter 3, galloping through it. Um, And I'm reading from the NIV translation, which is what you've got on your pews. So you can either follow it through the Bible or it will be up on the screen. I'm starting at verse 9. Oh, okay. Just... It picks it up on the screen on verse 10, but I'm going to start at verse 9. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now, may our God and Father himself And our Lord Jesus, clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. Amen. This is the word of God. Please bless it to us, Lord. It's just a short passage, but there's a lot in it. And I thank Mike for leaving me by verse (laughs) 9. He really wanted to go into it last week, but he left it with me. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you. Um, Dr. Fritz Talbot from Boston, after visiting Germany, this is before the First World War, just before it, but he imported the idea of tenderness and care, not so much in words, but in actual practice. Tenderness and caring. See, Talbot had visited various institutions for young children and orphans (coughs) during his visit. All of these institutions were clean and orderly, as were the children. However, what really caught Talbot's curiosity in one of these homes was a rather large, fat old lady who was carrying a baby perched on her hip. You know how we do that, mothers? We go around with that baby on your hip. And, and he asked, who is that? And they said, oh, that, that's uh, old Anna. When we have given a child all possible medical care and he still doesn't get better or thrive, we bring in old Anna. We turn to old Anna. She never fails. Love never fails. You see, you need love to thrive 
and to grow. And we've heard the same stories of Romanian orphans rocking back and forward in their cots. Their physical needs are taken care of, but starved of love, they don't thrive, they don't flourish. Everyone needs love. And we as Christians are called to give it. We were made to let love overflow. It's a trait that's passed on to us from our Heavenly Father whose very essence and character is love. God's character and actions show a Father who just overflows with love and he wants that for us. And God demonstrates his overflowing love in this. He sent Jesus into the world to bring us back into relationship with him. Jesus, though fully God, emptied himself of all his divine privileges and he died in our place on a cross. And Jesus saw the results of his sacrifice and was satisfied. And the Father was glorified and the world was forever changed. And that is what is possible when God's love overflows through us. The world around us is changed. The world within our congregation is changed when love overflows from us one to another. In our journey of faith, as we learn to trust in Jesus more and more, so our love for him grows. Now, Brian's not always comfortable with this kind of language with me because I go around saying, I love you, Jesus, all the time. And he'll go, who are you talking to? I'm talking to Jesus. I say it to him as well. It says in Ephesians 3, being rooted and established in love, we begin to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. It's more than we can contain Imagine that. And as God's love overflows from us, we're filled with joy. God gets the glory and the world benefits as the church is built and God's family grows. You need love to grow. You need love to thrive. So when you see fellowships that are not thriving or people that aren't growing, The root cause is probably a lack of love. They've maybe been hurt by the church, hurt by someone. Their hearts are shut off. In John's gospel, Jesus said in chapter 13, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And one of the greatest ways we can show our love for God is to love one another. If God's looking in on us today and we pray he's here in amongst us, is God saying there's a fellowship that love one another? I can do a lot with them. Over and over again in the New Testament, we see the correlation between the love of God and love for people. The two are intertwined. And scripture makes it clear that it's not negotiable. We can't opt out because we're none too fond of a particular individual or group. 1 John 4, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says I love God and yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So the way we love one another and treat one another is our witness to non-believers because it stands in contrast, or at least it should do, to what people experience in the world. So where are we with Paul's letter to the believers in Thessalonians? We know after a short missionary visit lasting just over three weeks, Paul had to leave. But as we heard from Mike last week, Paul's heart remained with them. It wasn't a case of out of sight, out of mind. 
Paul was not a man who was only interested in what happened while he was there and then lost interest as soon as he was gone. He longed to see them and he wanted so much to be with them. There's no Zoom calls here, no FaceTime. I'm facing a situation where my youngest son is moving to Thailand permanently. And I th my heart kind of sunk when he told me this. But then, you know, I up and left and went to Hong Kong in the 1980s and said to my mum, I'll be back in a few years. But at least I have FaceTime. I have Zoom calls. Many of us may have folk we care about in Australia or wherever, but we've got that. Nothing like that for Paul. He writes to them, or he sends people to the churches that he's involved in, that he loves, the people he loves. And he's longing to be with them, just to see them. So often Paul is trying to sort out problems in fellowships. But with this lot, he just has a heart full of love for them. They're newbies, they're his kids. He's planted this church, they're new in the faith, and he just wants to be with them. He wants to help them grow in that faith so it's not snatched from them. He'd already warned them it will be tough. There will be a cost in following Jesus. If anyone doesn't let you know that, then they're not being fair. There is a cost in following Jesus. There are trials. He told them, you'll encounter opposition and difficulties. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. And Paul, like the spiritual father that he is, is concerned for the newly found faith to be able to withstand opposition and trial. I wonder if those amongst us who are quite new to the faith have found honeymoon period was quite short. Things started coming against them. But God allows that because it also builds us up in our faith if we can come through these trials and opposition. But however much he wants to be with them, he apparently can't get back to them, we're told, because Satan is blocking his return. He's blocking his path. This would suggest to me that Satan doesn't want these young believers to take root in their faith. So he works to keep their leader away from them by hindering Paul in some way. If Satan can keep Christians apart, he will. If Satan can keep teacher and pupil apart, he will. If Satan can block someone who can meet the spiritual needs of a group of Christians, he will. He will use sickness, opposition, discouragement, lies, whatever it takes to stop Christians receiving the nourishment and instruction needed in order to grow. He will try to isolate Christians from one another when they could be fellowshipping and building one another up. And I wonder if any of you have experienced something like that, where you've been kind of picked off and isolated from your fellowship and your friends. This keeping apart from Christian brothers and Christian sisters. And scripture says, don't forget to meet with one another. There's a purpose in that. So Paul sent Timothy, even though he couldn't get back to them, he sent Timothy to check in with this group of believers in his absence. And Timothy comes back and give such a good report about them. They're doing more than okay. They're standing. Despite the pressure and the persecution, and Paul is just so overjoyed to hear this and thankful to God for his grace and his goodness in keeping them. There's nothing more encouraging for a teacher, a mentor, or a pastor someone who has sown into someone's life than to hear that that person is going on with the Lord. Think for a moment of those you, that have been instrumental in your journey of faith. You might have to go back a bit, but think of those who really helped you on your journey of faith. Have you ever let them know how you're doing? Is there any 
positive feedback you could give them? Or would you rather they didn't know how you're doing? When someone you have invested in slips back into old ways, it affects your spirit. But when you hear that someone has gone on, who's standing and who's developing in faith and love, it puts new life into you and increases your faith. You're thankful to God and you pray with even greater hope and fervor. Do you remember the laddie that Lee was when he first came here? Three and a half years ago. A lovely boy, a bit rough around the edges. But God inputted into him and he grew in this fellowship. And look at the man that left to go on to study to be a minister of the gospel. How did it make us feel? We were part of that. We were part of that journey. And it blessed us and gave us joy and hope. We want to nurture people in their faith. Well, Paul was no different. These were his kids in Thessalonica. And he'd only been them a short time and he'd warned them stuff was coming and then he gets the report. They're doing good. They're doing good. But that's not enough. That's not enough. The faithfulness of Paul's converts was a matter of life and death to Paul. After months of being really anxious about them, he hears the good news. It's all right, they're going on. They are as strong as ever. So Paul's delight and joy over this news is very obvious. Now, having received that news, you might think Paul would say, great, job done. That's them sorted. Tick. I can cross them off my prayer list. I can stop thinking about them day and night. I can move on to Athens or Corinth. They're doing well. I can leave them to it. But that's not how Paul responds. He acknowledges it's God that's kept them, and he wants nothing less than the best for these believers, a cup that is overflowing with everything that God has for them. Because, friends, with God, there is always so much more. Did you realize that? Do you think my cup's pretty full? I'm quite happy with what I've got. Well, God wants to say to you this morning, I've got more. If you choose it, I've got more. Paul thinks, I don't want them to miss out on all that God has for them. I don't want them to be lacking in any area. They've just started on this journey of faith and sanctification. There's more. They need to know more doctrine, more truth, more about God. So he's going to increase his prayer for them, not decrease it. Paul prays that he might be able to see them. Clear the way, God. Lord Jesus, make a way for us to get back to them. Do you hear it in his prayer? Can I tell you, this is a prayer that will not be answered for another five years. Doesn't get back to them for five years. What can we learn from this? Are we prepared to press in with our prayers for others for that amount of time? I heard a testimony this week, very encouraging testimony, of a mother who's been praying for her daughter for over 16 years, and this prayer has just been answered. Our daughter's come to faith. Now, is this mother annoyed that it took so long? No. No. She's rejoicing that the prayer has been answered in God's way and in God's time. It took five years. We don't know if Paul's had to overcome obstacles Satan has placed in his way. Satan did not want this group of believers to grow in wisdom and love. What a threat they must have represented to Satan's kingdom to go to such efforts to stop their leader getting to them and build them up in the truth and in love. But of course, sometimes it can be the Holy Spirit who prevents us from going somewhere when God has a greater purpose. Satan may try to sideline, but he will never stop the plans of God. Never. Have you got tissues? Sorry. (laughs) 
got a bit of a runny nose. Excuse me a minute. Friends, I wonder, <coughs> do we threaten Satan in this way with our faith and our love for one another and for those outside the church? How long might we have been dealing with obstacles for growth? And what might they be? What have we learned by going through trials and opposition? And I know this church has gone through difficulties. But here's the truth for every one of us. Sorry, I've got a shoulder pad that's decided to part with me. Keep me humble, Lord. Eh? There we go. Let's just take it out. <sighs> I don't want shoulder now. It's that bearing on my hip. <laughs> this is what I felt the Lord was saying to me through this passage. And it's a truth for every one of us. We will only ever fully realize the fullness of God in our faith by the level or trust we give him and the depth we choose to go into. That's why that chorus that came up that Gordon would have chosen was so important. Refiner's fire, purify my heart. I choose to be holy. There's a choice involved. If you want more, there is so much more. Overflow means that you're not able to hold. That's the generosity of God. Do you remember the old song? My granny used to sing it, Running Over. Do you remember that one? Running over, running over, my cup's full and running over. <laughs> As a kid, you know how you pick things up wrong? I used to sing Granny Nova. <laughs> granny Nova, my cup's full of Granny Nova, whoever she was. But you get the idea. My cup's full and running over. It's an overflow. It's more than you can hold. It's the generosity of God who wants you to have more, more love, more anointing, greater holiness. But if you're content with a little God, and that's usually because we want to hold on to other stuff, we can live forever at that level. We are unable to receive everything God has for us if our hands and our hearts hold on to things that God would rather we gave up or put down. We're called to die to self, to the things that belong to the old, unredeemed nature, character deficiencies, when we refuse to be changed. This will stem or block the overflow that Paul is talking about, the abundance, the fullness of life that Jesus promised. You know, if you come to the open house cafe on a Tuesday or a Thursday morning, you are offered a selection of coffees to choose from if you haven't been in. And there's a different sized cup for each one. Some people, not that many I have to say, like an espresso. You know, a quick hit of caffeine comes in a little cup, tiny cup. Some like a milky latte, which comes in a tall, slim glass. An Americano comes in a, a robust mug. But a cappuccino comes in a large, vat-like cup and holds the most coffee of, of them all. It has, it has chocolate sprinkled on the top. It's the full works. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to dob you in, Brian. One morning, Brian had a bit of a bad morning in the cafe. He had pressed the coffee machine for a latte, and the glass was only half full. There's something wrong with this machine, he said. And we threw the coffee down the sink. It was wasted and started again. The same thing happened again. Two coffees now wasted. Then we checked the milk bit of the machine and that was filled okay, so we couldn't work out what was wrong until we noticed there's a thin tube that comes from the milk part of the machine into the coffee part of the machine and it wasn't attached. So the coffee was coming through but the milk wasn't getting through. You can only get a full cup when you're attached to the source. Well, a bit flustered from that episode, 
Brian then tried to fill an Americano mug with the contents of a cappuccino and wondered why it was spilling over the top. But it just couldn't contain the volume of coffee that was pouring out another coffee down the sink. You see, you have to choose the size of cup according to the amount of coffee and strength that you really want. You have to be attached to the source to receive your fill. And God will happily give you the full work sprinkled chocolate the lot if we say yes. I choose holiness. I choose to be holy. Our God is a God of abundance. His love is never stingy. It comes from the overflow of his heart to us to enable us to love the unlovely, to love one another as Jesus loves us and gave his life for us. Paul would meet up with the believers in Thessalonica he loved so much. He would meet with them again, but it would take five years. But he did get back to them and he never stopped praying for them he prays, may your love increase and overflow for each other just as ours does for you. Paul is thankful for the joy of seeing these believers redeemed from their past. His efforts weren't wasted. Standing in the present, redeemed from their past, standing in the present despite persecution, but he wants them to grow, to be filled, to overflowing with love and matured in any areas that are lacking, where there are gaps in their understanding of the knowledge of God, and made ready for Christ's return. There's three parts to this prayer. Thankful that they're redeemed from their sin and their past, standing in their present, getting made ready for Christ's return. He wants them holy and blameless when Jesus comes. When the Lord comes back and says to each and every one of us, what have you done on earth with the gifts I gave you and the people I put in your path? If we're able to point to others as our hope and say, Lord, I helped Bring these to yourself. They are my crown, my joy, and my reward. I loved abundantly with the love you gave me. We know that love never fails, and in this, God is glorified. You know, when I was a, a less mature Christian <laughs> and a, a younger minister, full of energy and enthusiasm, as we so often are when we start out, for winning souls gave me such joy. I had boldness and a pioneering spirit that wanted to see revival break out wherever I ministered. What a cheeky. Eh? <laughs> Who do I think I am? But experience taught me about the power of God's love over my energetic efforts, however well meaning they were. I'm older, I'm weaker and I'm definitely fatter. But like old Anna, sharing the love of God is more like holding a child on your hip and just loving them. It's not glamorous, but it's real. It's real. Are you fool to overflowing with the love of God this morning? with everything God has for you? Have you got stuck somewhere along the way and your cup is half empty? And you might be believing this is all there is. This will see mute. I pray the prayer Paul prayed for his wee flock in Thessalonica. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God the Father when Jesus comes, when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Redeemed from the past, standing in the present, being made holy and ready for when Jesus comes again. 
Let us pray. What a wonderful demonstration of love Paul gives us. We often just see him, Father, as this evangelist who's getting people sorted out from their problems. And, but he's got such a father's love. He reflects your love. He cared about his kids the way you care about us the way you want to give us everything that we need. And Father God, Lord knows this world needs love. This world that is so broken and cruel and unkind and, and suspicious and we just pull each other down. Accusations. We see it in politicians and we see it in leadership we pray this morning, Father God, that you would raise up leaders who have a heart for people, whether that's in the church or in the community or in the halls of Westminster, that they have integrity and holiness within them and a desire to see people lifted up, people who are difficult to love, were we so lovely? We pray for our politicians this morning. We pray that they might be men and women of truth and integrity. That they're prepared to pay the price. To serve. We pray for those in leadership in our community, for the weight they bear and the decisions they have to make that are often so tough. We pray for our NHS, which we are told is utterly broken and on its knees. And we pray for every servant who's serving in the NHS, whether that's on the wards, whatever position they have, to keep this wonderful institution going that does look to care for the least and the last and the lost. And we ask, Lord, for you to bless the NHS. And that might mean tough decisions for the rest of us. It might mean we have to do with a bit less that others would have a little bit more. We pray for those who suffer from mental health, kids that really are struggling for lack of assurance and love, for kids that are being violent on our streets. We believe, Lord, that when we partner you in prayer, when we come with our intercessions, that you move in these prayers. So we lift this whole situation of the violence on our streets and the knife crimes and the young people who are committing these crimes, that they would know the love of God beyond everything else, that you would send people to be alongside them. Send us, Lord, that we would share the overflow of our heart and not be afraid, and not keep that love for ourselves. There's an abundance of it. Thank you, Father. We want the cappuccino. We want the full cup with the chocolate sprinkled on top. We want to share it with one another, and forgive us if we have held anything against a brother or sister. We pray that there would be forgiveness extended and offered and received. So hear our prayers now, Lord, for we ask them in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Sunday podcast from our team. If you'd like more details about GMC and who we are, what we believe and how we serve, then visit our website at gillespiechurch.org. Find us on Facebook or look back at some of the videos on our YouTube channel. Just search Gillespie Memorial Church. All inquiries can be made through the Contact Us page on our website. Again, details are in the show notes. 
If you'd like to support our work with a financial donation, then offerings can be made by clicking the Support Us with Stewardship icon through the homepage of our website. If you liked what you heard, then please follow our podcast page, like it and share it with friends and family. This has been a production of GMC, including the pastors and the tech team, or copyright remains with the producers. Today's episode was edited by Jack Wiggle, and the soundtrack is Blessed Assurance by the team at City of Light, performed by Gordon Eastop and Mike Weaver. Thanks for listening, and God bless.